Good morning to you. Yeah, I begin with a prayer, a prayer for presence. In the gift of this new day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined, let us be grateful. Let us be attentive. Let us be open to what has never happened before. In the gift of this new day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined. Amen. Again, may I say how pleased I am to be among you. Thank you for the welcome. Last night we were remembering that most cherished image in the Celtic world from which I draw heavily in my life and in my teachings. That memory that image of John the Beloved leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper and how it was said of him in the Celtic world that he had therefore heard the heartbeat of God. How he then became a symbol of the practice of listening, listening deep within ourselves, listening deep within one another, listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred presence. I invite us back into this posture, what I believe to be the essential posture of true relationship. We also last night heard from Julian of Norwich, that 14th century Christian teacher, who said so simply, but so radically, we are not just made by God, we are made of God. So last night we were beginning to ask what would it look like for those true depths are of Godness to be born again, to come forth anew in radically fresh and new expression. And I was inviting us to ask this question as individuals, but also to ask it together. What would it look like at this moment in time for there to be a radical new birthing from within the soul of our Christian household, that we might again be bearers of blessing, that we might serve this moment in time. Last night we looked at one of the major characteristics of this rebirthing of the sacred from within. And as we look at some of the characteristics of this rebirthing, I want to emphasize that this is not just a set of ideas about what might be, but rather is an attempt to articulate what is already stirring within us. So last night we were looking at this major characteristic of rebirthing that we're in the midst of, and that is the desire to come back into relationship with the sacredness of the earth. This morning I'd like to look at one of the other major characteristics of this rebirthing, and that is the desire to come into relationship with the wisdom of other great spiritual traditions. We are being called into a new and radical humility, I believe, in which we come to know deeply within ourselves that our fullness of maturity our completion of soul will come only to the extent that we receive humbly from the wisdom of other great traditions. And that these great traditions are given not to compete with each other, but to complete each other. 
This morning, I invite us to listen to another great prophet in our Christian household. Last night, we were listening to Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and his prophetic announcing of love of Christ, love of earth, as being interwoven. This morning, I invite us to listen to another great prophet in our Christian household, and I refer to Bede Griffiths, B-E-D-E, Bede Griffiths, G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H-S, an English Benedictine monk who spent most of his life in India. I invite us to listen to his story and the insights of his journey into the heart of the East and particularly into the heart of Hinduism. I invite us to allow his journey to be a type of lens through which we look at the journey that we are being invited into. In our case, it may not be to the East. Who are the people in our neighborhoods of other religious traditions? Who are the bearers of great wisdom from other spiritual traditions that we are being invited to move more deeply into relationship with in our home communities and in this nation. And I invite us especially to be attentive to that sacred journey to the heart of Islam that we are being invited into if we are serious about the way of peacemaking and transformation. Bede spoke about finding what he called the other half of his soul in India. He went as a young Benedictine monk, but even in his initial going to India, he was aware that he was journeying as a pilgrim into another land towards the heart of another tradition. Think of how our history as a Western Christian tradition might have been so different if we had journeyed as pilgrims. That is, expecting to receive as well as to give in relationship. Many years ago, I was giving a talk in Ottawa in Canada on some of the themes of the Celtic tradition, but we were looking especially at the prologue to John's Gospel and especially those words in the prologue that speak of the true light that enlightens every person coming into the world. A Mohawk elder had been invited to be in attendance at the talk in order that he could make observation at the end of my talk about any of the parallels between his First Nations spirituality, his Mohawk spirituality, and Celtic spirituality. This strong Mohawk elder stood at the end of the talk to make observation. He said, as I have been listening to these themes, I have been wondering where I would be tonight. I have been wondering where my people would be tonight. I have been wondering where we would be as a Western world tonight. If the mission that had come to us from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us. We cannot undo the tragic wrongs that have been done in the name of the truly humble one, Jesus. We cannot erase our history of being perhaps the most arrogant display of religiosity that the world has ever witnessed, triumphing, conquering in the name of Christ. We can, however, be part of a new birthing. And I believe the marks of this rebirthing are of a radical humility that will invite us to move as pilgrims to the heart of other traditions 
in order to be strengthened in our own Christhood. Even before Bede went to India, he was aware of what he called the fossilization of much of Western Christianity, how in its doctrinal form and liturgical form it had often become ossified or fixed. And he was aware even at that stage that anything that is not unfolding in the universe is finished. Because the very nature of the universe is that it keeps unfolding. It keeps finding new form, new expression. So Bede never shied away from naming the ossification or from prophetically naming that there was much that was rotten in our Christian inheritance. But he invited us especially to be aware of the treasure that we hold in our inheritance that can be blessing for this moment in time. So he said, yes, let's not pretend that there isn't rottenness. But he said, there are seeds in the rotten apple. There are seeds in the rotten apple. So if we are serious about being bearers of blessing in the world, in our relationship with other wisdom traditions, in the gifts that we bring to be part of transformation, <clears throat> let us keep our, our eyes on the seeds. Thomas Berry, the eco-theologian, whom some of you will have come across and will be hearing more from Thomas Berry in the second part of the morning. Thomas Berry uses an analogy that I find helpful. He speaks about the microphase of any religious tradition, <clears throat> that is, the early stage of a religious tradition when it's just been born when it's just discovering its charism for humanity, the microphase on the one end, and then what he calls the macrophase at the other end when a tradition grows up, when it moves into its maturity and confidence of being. And he says in the microphase of a religious tradition, when a tradition is like a young sapling that's just emerged from the ground, it needs some protection. It needs a type of fencing in or boundary to protect the young thing. And in its microphase, he says, in its early stage, it's primarily those who come within the boundaries that receive the blessing. When a tradition grows up, however, when it comes of age, it can offer its blessings freely way beyond the boundaries of its definition. Think, for instance, of the great maturity of Hinduism. Think of how Hinduism, at this moment in time, has blessed the whole world with a single phrase, Namaste, N-A-M-A-S-T-E, Namaste, which is becoming common parlance throughout the whole world. This phrase that means the sacred in me bows to the sacred in you, the divine in me honors the divine in you. A great blessing. Hinduism gives it away freely. We're not required to become Hindu in order to access this wisdom in this greeting, in this stance in relation to one another. Think of the treasure in our Jesus wisdom that we have to offer the world at this moment in time. We're being invited to grow up and to find ways of freely offering our blessing, not on the basis of whether people come within our boundary walls whether they sign up to our confessions, 
whether they access our sacraments. The maturity of our Christhood is what we are being called to live into. Early in the 1960s, Bede arrived at the Benedictine community of Shantivanam in Tamil Nadu. <clears throat> it means forest of peace. It was a Benedictine monastery, but it increasingly styled itself under Bede's leadership as an Indian ashram. It was there that he developed his vision and practice of what he called the marriage of East and West. And this was also the title of one of his greatest books, The Marriage of East and West, in which he sees that we are being invited to strip Christ of his Western garments and allow him to be clothed in the meditative wisdoms and practices of the East. And of course, Jesus was from the East, as Mahatma Gandhi used to like to say, when Christianity went to the West, it became a servant of empire. At Shantivanam in India, Bede led this vision of a profound and reverent meeting between East and West. That morning prayer at the ashram. Scripture would be read from the Vedas, the ancient Hindu scriptures, from the Hebrew scriptures, the Quran, the Christian scriptures. In meditative practice, there was a learning of some of the simple and ancient meditative wisdom of the East. After morning mass, those who received the bread and the wine were offered also the bindi, that is the dot on the center of the forehead, the symbol of wisdom for those who participated in the communion of Christ, were bearers of the wisdom of Christ. This was not syncretism. This was Bede's belief in marriage. that marriage is not about conformity to the other. It's not about uniformity. It's about union at the deepest of levels. Who are the people who have most loved us in our lives? Who are the ones with whom we have known the deepest of unions? True union of heart, of soul. These are often the ones who have most radically set us free to be ourselves. Their love has not called us to conform to them, but their love has set us free. And this is what I find in my relationship with teachers of other great traditions. They're not looking for uniformity. Of course not. And what they look to me to be true to is Jesus. And often their perceptions of the wisdom that Jesus embodies is sharper and clearer than how Jesus is accessed even within our own household. They look with considerable amazement at the fact that we so honor Jesus in our language and yet disregard his teachings about nonviolence. They're perplexed. Why are we not accessing our treasure? Let's look at some of what the West and the East bring in their dowries to this marriage. The West never forgets the transcendence of the sacred. 
the aboveness, and in that sense, the otherness, the beyondness of the sacred. The East, on the other hand, never forgets the immanence, the withinness of the sacred, to be looked for in all life. In our Christian household, of course, we have had great teachers that know about both. Think of Meister Eckhart, the 14th century teacher, who says, God is both unnameable and omni-nameable. There is nothing that can be said that can in any sense define or capture the mystery of God, unnameable. And God is at the same time, he said, omni-nameable. Each one of you, a unique manifestation of the one, as we were saying last night, the essence of your being is expression is word of God, each one of you, an unrepeatable, unique manifestation. Some of you may have come across the British Jesuit, Jerry Hughes, and his writings. He is known for such works as God of Surprises. But Jerry Hughes at conferences such as this when people were introducing himself, themselves, he would say, Hello, I'm Jerry, a unique manifestation of the divine. <laughs> During one of my first visits to India, I was in Bangalore, and we delicate Westerners sometimes find the East too much of a, a bombardment of the senses. You know, it's just coming all the time, and sight and color and scent. And my practice in Bangalore during the days I was there was to spend a bit of time every day in the Laobag Gardens, the botanical gardens at the heart of Bangalore, just to have a little bit more space from the bombardment of the senses. One of the things I've loved about India is just how willing and eager people are to engage, not just in trivial conversations about the weather and about cricket and so on, but often wanting to move quite deep, quickly, into spiritual and philo philosophical reflection. So I was seated on a bench in the Laobag Gardens on this one afternoon, and an elderly Indian gentleman strolled up to me. It turned out he was a retired Indian banker. And he began by saying, Namaste. The divine in me honors or greets the divine in you. And after some initial conversation, he said, I have one question for you. And he asked it with that lovely wagging of the head. I have one question for you. He said, who are you? And I sensed he wasn't asking me what my name was, but I thought, well, I'm going to feel my way into this conversation. So I said, my name is John Philip. And he said, I was not asking you what your name was. <laughs> I was asking, who are you? So I said to him, I come from the same one you come from. And that pleased him well enough to move even more deeply in conversation. And over the next number of minutes, he gave me a type of synopsis of Hindu wisdom. And he spoke of the life within all life of the soul within all souls. And then he said, I must be going now, but I have one final thing to say to you. He said, you are God. And until you realize that you are God, you will not be wise, you will not be happy, you will not be free. Namaste, and off he wandered. 
Since then, I've often wondered when I'm going to have such a conversation in the Edinburgh Botanical Gardens <coughs> with a retired Scottish banker, a retired Scottish Presbyterian banker. Well, how do we hear the wisdom of the East? Because we have lived in such a divorce that we're, we are likely to not understand what that gentleman was saying. And in the West, we have so defined ourselves in terms of our ego that we are likely to mishear him as addressing my ego. But one only has to scratch the surface of Indian wisdom to know that emphatically he was not addressing my ego. He was addressing that depth in me that can only be accessed through dissolving the ego or through dissolving the way in which the ego tries to claim center ground. The ego given rather to serve the center, but not to pretend that it is the center. Again, we have had great teachings in our Christian history that invite us to know this. Meister Eckhart, again, this 14th century teacher, said, God is to be found in the human soul, not by addition, but by subtraction. God is to be found in the human soul, not by addition, but by subtraction. We don't need to add anything to the human soul to find the sacred presence. We don't need to invoke something beyond us or above us. The sacred is deep within us. That is our essence. We have come from the womb of the one. We do, however, need to do this robust work of subtraction. And this is what we owe one another in the closest relationships of our lives. This is what we owe one another in our religious practices, in our spiritual communities. The discipline, the practice of subtraction or of dissolving the way in which the ego claims to be the center because it is only to this extent that we will access the wisdom, the creativity, the love longings, as we were saying last night, that are at the core of our being. We are living in a moment in this land and in, this wor in the world in which, maybe like never before, we are being ac invited to access soul strength. Because it is only soul strength that is up to the enormous tasks that confront us of working for what is just, of deeply recognizing the sacredness of every race, of every religion, of deeply recognizing the sacredness of the feminine within us and within our mothers and our daughters and sisters. This moment calls for strength of soul and we will only access it to the extent that we commit ourselves to the disciplines of subtraction. Let's look at something else that the West and the East bring to this marriage, to this true reverencing of each other. The West doesn't forget about the permanence of the physical. Yes, we know the physical is passing, 
but we give the physical great regard. The East, on the other hand, never forgets the impermanence of the physical, that it's all passing. And one of the words that's very central in Eastern wisdom is the word maya, M-A-Y-A. Sometimes incorrectly it is translated as unreality, but I think that's to misrepresent the word maya. Maya means more impermanent. Everything's passing. And in that sense, nothing outward has ultimate reality. It's all passing. But the East includes in Maya, impermanence, passing. The East uses the word Maya to refer also to religion. It also is passing. It exists only to serve that which is not passing or pointing beyond itself. Years ago, when I was beginning a sermon at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, and the pulpit in St. Giles Cathedral hugs one of the central four pillars, which have been there for over a thousand years. It's one of my favorite ecclesiastical places, standing within those four pillars. But I began the sermon by saying there will come a time when this cathedral is no more. There will come a time when our Christian scriptures are no more. There will come a time when Christianity is no more. This final statement was too much for one of my congregants, and she shouted out from the back of the church, heresy. This, of course, was when the rest of the congregation woke up. <laughs> I could see people looking at one another as if to say, did he say something? <laughs> we really need such a plant in, in, in church every Sunday. But this woman was furious, and she was in one of those traditional Scottish boxed pews. And in order to get out, which she wanted to do, she slammed the door open and then slammed it shut and stomped down the central aisle. She had really power dressed that day. She had good hard heels on. And she got to the main uh, west door and shouted one more time. Uh, this time it wasn't heresy, it was heretic. And she slammed the door. There's a tendency to absolutize our religion. And when we do that, we forget that our religion is just a road sign. It's meant to point beyond itself. And when we forget that, it becomes not a road sign, it becomes a stop sign, or it becomes a destination. Every summer, my wife and I spend a bit of time in the high desert of New Mexico, and it's been a time of very rich collaboration with uh, a rabbi from Santa Fe and a Muslim Sufi teacher from New Mexico. A number of summers ago, uh, at the conference center in, Ghost Ra in New Mexico called Ghost Ranch. I was there teaching, but on this occasion, I wasn't, in fact, collaborating with my rabbi brother, Nachum. He was teaching another class, but we were on the ranch to get at the same time. But the group I was teaching that this particular morning that I'm remembering, we were looking at that beautiful resurrection story from John's Gospel in which Mary Magdalene goes to the garden and finds that the tomb has, the, the sto stone has been rolled away and she fears that someone has stolen the body of her beloved, of her teacher. 
And she's standing in the garden weeping. And the risen Christ speaks to her. At first she thinks he's the gardener, but it's when he calls her by name that she recognizes him. And then there's a very brief dialogue in which Jesus says to her, do not hold me. Do not hold me. I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Do not hold me. As I was reflecting on this passage with the group I was teaching, I kept thinking of my brother, Rabbi Nachum. And I kept thinking, I must speak to him about this passage. I thought I wanted to share a type of theological observation that Christianity has tried to hold Jesus. So I looked out for him at lunch, and we ended up in the same queue and picking up our food. And I asked if I could speak to him. So we took our trays out to a picnic table just outside the dining hall. And when I began to speak, thinking I had this great theological observation to offer him, I began to weep. And I realized this is not a theological observation I'm making. This is a spiritual confession I'm offering. And I realized I had to ask his forgiveness. And I realized I had to seek the forgiveness of his tradition for the way in which we've tried to hold Jesus. We've tried to say he's ours. He's not ours. He was born a Jew. He lived a Jew. He died a faithful Jew. And we've tried to hold him so closely that we've prevented many of our brothers and sisters of Judaism from accessing this great teacher of theirs because we've said you can access him through our doctrines, through our sacraments, through our propositions about who he was. And is. How do we learn how to freely offer Jesus, to offer his wisdom right into the heart of this moment in time? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All, <clears throat> all great teachers know that they are passing. Think of the amount of time given in John's Gospel to Jesus speaking of the coming of the Spirit who would do in them what the Spirit had done in him. My first trip to India was in 1990. I went at the invitation of Harry Underhill, who was the nephew of the great English mystic Evelyn Underhill. Harry observed that the Iona community that I was leading on Iona, the Abbey community on Iona, that we could do with some exposure to the East. So he offered to take me to Bede Griffith's Shantivanam in Tamil Nadu. I accepted the invitation, but part of me was anxious about going to the East. I was still a good Western boy. I'd been trained in one of the greatest places of philosophical theology in the Western world in Edinburgh, where we thought we knew it all. All of our training was up here. 
ideas. I knew next to nothing about how to access the heart. I hadn't been trained in even the simplest of meditative practices. I was more than 21, but I had about me what G.K. Chesterton calls the towering infallibility of 21. But I agreed to go, even though I knew there was some anxiety. Was this not a world of delusion? The Eastern exploration of the interior, was this not a world just of subjectivity and possible delusion? My anxieties became pretty clear in a dream on the first night in India. I had a dream in which I was drinking vodka with Mikhail Gorbachev, <laughs> as one does in one's dreams. My wife tells me I have a very inflated dream ego. <laughs> but there I was in the dream, knocking back shots of vodka with my good buddy, Mikhail. And after the third shot in the dream, I discovered a chemical residue at the bottom of the glass. And in the dream, I thought, I'm being drugged. When I woke up, even though at that stage in my life, I didn't pay too much attention to my dreams, even I could understand an anxiety that was spoken in the dream. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev is not exactly an Eastern guru, but this was February 1990. This was two months after the Berlin Wall had come down. Gorbachev was at the height of his revolution of thought. Glasnost, teaching openness, perestroika, being restructured through relationship. And I was being invited to be open to the East and to allow myself to be restructured through relationship. We arrived at Shantivanam after nightfall, so I hadn't yet seen the landscape of the ashram Benedictine community under daylight, but we were told as we were being shown to our monastic cells for the night that early in the morning there would be a ringing of the bell and that would signal the time of meditation down by the river Calvary. So I heard the bells, <clears throat> got up and just followed the sound of footsteps down towards the river. Arrived, and it was very early dawn, just a bit of light beginning to come, enough for me to see some of the monks of the community dressed in their saffron-colored garb. I was aware of villagers hunkered down with their hands over their knees, waiting for the rising of the sun, as they have been doing since time immemorial, the sacred moment of transition from dark to light. I became uh, aware that there were also many Westerners there. And I had, as I stood there, I had one of the most important realizations of my life. My realization was I do not have a clue what to do. All my training had been up here. I didn't know how to access silence. I didn't know how to pray meditatively. So that realization led me later that same day to seek the guidance of one of the old monks at Shantivanam. And he chose to teach me what is probably the most ancient and the simplest of meditative practices that comes from the East. And that is a simple repetition of the first word, Om. This word that, of course, 
we've been reflecting on in different ways. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything has come into being through the Word. The East has a very parallel perception. In the beginning was Om. That was the first word. That was the first sound. And everything has come into being through that first sound, the sound of the One. So this wise old monk invited me, first of all, just to be aware of my breathing and how when we breathe in, when we inhale, our body lifts up slightly. And when we exhale, when we breathe out, our body settles in a downward movement. And he invited me to allow that to become the mantric rhythm of the repetition. So he invited me to say Om in the downward breath, addressing that sound that is at the heart of my being, at the heart of all being, that word or that sounding of the one. And then in my intake or uptake of breath, to receive from that depth that is within me, to allow that word or that sound to fill my being. So simple. When I returned to the West, I carried this way of meditative prayer with me, and it has been my staple diet of prayer ever since. Although when I came back to the West, I wanted often to bring it into my own religious tradition, so sometimes instead of Om, I would want to use words from the book of Psalms, such as, you are my strength in the downward movement, addressing my true strength deeper than my ego, and in the out-breath to breathe up, to receive from that strength that is within, that strength that we don't need to add. <clears throat> we need to open to it. And I found myself also wanting to Christianize this practice. So I found myself sometimes using one of Jesus' favorite mantras of teaching, which was die to live. Die to live. Die to the way in which I so often define myself in terms of my ego die in order to truly live, in order to live from my sacred depths and to breathe up from that depth to be true. Some of you know <clears throat> that my second daughter, Kirsten, who is a dancer, spent five years in India at a dance ashram where she learned the sacred dance of India, Bharatanatyam. <clears throat> I would say that Kirsten, over those five years, found the other half of her soul. Just as Bede had spoken of finding the other half of his soul in India, so I think Kirsten found the other half. But the big difference, of course, I think in Kirsten's case is that when she went to India, she didn't know the first half of her soul. But it was through India and through her immersion in Hindu dance and wisdom and meditation that she found and claimed the first half of her soul, her Christian inheritance. And this is what true relationship between traditions is about. The wisdom, the practices, the insights of another tradition can lead us more deeply to reclaim and live into the depths of our initial inheritance. This is what great leaders like 
Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. This is exactly what they do when people come to them for the wisdom of Buddhism. Of course, they share. But they also say, "Go back. Go back to your home tradition, and dig deep there. Access the first half of your soul." The dance ashram where Christian was for five years <clears throat> had been founded in part Kalakshetra by name had been founded in part by Mahatma Gandhi in the run up to Indian independence. He was aware that part of nationhood was a deep reclaiming of the art forms and the spiritual practices of India. Christian, of course, had grown up in the West. From knee high, she had been a dancer, and she was trained, of course, in the West in ballet. So she was forever on tiptoe and leaving the ground. This transcendent movement in so much Western dance. But what she found herself doing now in the East was nearly always flat-footed, bent-kneed. Pounding the earth to receive, release the sacred from within, the immanence of the East. In her case, it was her body that led her to find the other half. What are the intuitions in us? What are the desires, or yearnings, or longings in us that we are being invited to pay attention to? That will take us. To find the other half, or the other parts of our soul, that other traditions know more immediately about and can guide us in. Morning prayer at Kalakshetra in India happened around a great banyan tree. I used to love my visits to Kalakshetra to visit Kristen. I loved that morning, that moment of morning prayer. In the early dawn, to see fifty-plus young women beautifully dressed in their saris, twenty-five young men plus dressed in their kurtas, coming for morning prayer around the banyan tree, the sacred tree in India. They would chant words from the Christian scriptures, from the Hindu scriptures, from the Muslim scriptures. Pray for peace. The banyan tree, the sacred tree, is a powerful image, I believe, for what we are being called to be as a tradition. It is a tree with a strong. Central system of trunk, but as branches reach out in every twenty-five feet or so, they dive back down into the ground to do a type of secondary rooting. In that way, the banyan tree becomes stronger and greater, more and more a place of sanctuary. This is how we can understand. Our inheritance, the strong central trunk system of our Christian inheritance, and we're being invited to reach out, I believe, and do secondary rooting in the wisdoms of other traditions, and through a reverencing of the people of other traditions, and that way become stronger, become more of a place of sanctuary. I was telling this story to a woman from Florida. It's not only women from Florida that I have conversations with, <laughs> but this woman from Florida explained to me when she heard the story of the banyan tree. She told me that her hometown in Florida had at one stage banyans along the central boulevard of the town. And the town council decided that it really wanted to tidy up 
these banyan trees. So they cut all the secondary roots. And when the next storm came in, all the banyans were knocked down. We're in the midst of mighty storms of change and challenge and transition. We will become not stronger by denying secondary rooting. We will become weaker. We will become less able to offer blessing, to offer profound spiritual sanctuary at this moment in time. We're being invited to be pilgrims, journeying towards the heart of other traditions, journeying with reverence to the heart of those we know from other traditions in order to receive and to give. We're going to again move from spoken word, ideas, images into a type of deeper listening and we'll do this again through chant form before we have our morning break. The CD that we're going to use this morning is uh, again one that I've created with these same Scottish musicians but in the second CD called Chanting for Peace we use words from the Quran, from the Hebrew scriptures, and from the teachings of Jesus to pray especially for peace. The chant that I invite us into now is based on words from the Quran. The words are in English, whichever way you turn, there is the face of God. Whichever way you turn, there is the face of God. You'll hear an Arabic descant running through the chant. The words you'll be hearing are Ya Basir, which means the face everywhere, or the eyes everywhere. Please join the chant as soon as you become familiar with it. There are a couple of instrumental interludes again, during which we can just allow the words of the chant to silently resonate within us, and then when the lyrics come back in, I invite you to join the chant. And during the chant, and for a moment of silence afterwards, I invite us just to pay attention again, not so much to think about the themes of the morning so far, but just pay attention. What's stirring? What's calling our deep attention? I chant, whichever way you turn, there is the face of God. A prayer before our mid-morning break, and we'll, uh, we'll aim to be back to start again at 10.30. Whichever way we turn, O oh God, there is your face. In the light of the moon and patterns of stars, in scarred mountain rifts and ancient groves, in mighty seas and creatures of the deep, whichever way we turn, O oh God, there is your face. In the light of eyes we love, in the salt of tears we have tasted, in weathered countenances east and west, in the soft skin glow of the child everywhere. Whichever way we turn, O oh God, there is your face, there is your face among us. Amen.